Hello. How are you guys doing? Y'all doing all right? Man, well, it's good to see you. I sure missed you guys last week, but I got some uh, time to spend with our Liberty Hill Church. And can I just tell you, thank you so much for paying for that. Give it up for yourself. Come on. Um, your investment is paying off. I was absolutely blown away by what God is doing on that side of Austin, and it's such an incredible thing to see. Thank you so much for your faithfulness to give and to sow into that, and to, many of you went and helped train that team and continue to provide support through our serve team, so thank you so much for that. For those of you who are new or visiting, my name's Stephen, and we actually started a series several weeks ago where together as a church family, we're going to go where most churches have never gone before. Come on. And we're essentially, the, the big idea of our series, This Means War, is really, you know, a lot of times people be like, oh, that's political, that's political. Here, here's the deal. Uh, po politics, political, just means public. That's what it means. And everything in private eventually becomes public. And here's the truth about many of the situations and the things that we're facing today. These are not political issues. They're moral issues that have political consequences. And when you look in the scripture, you can clap, sure, you can clap. You guys a little happy clappy, it's good. It won't make me any better, though. I'll just warn you. It won't make me any better or worse. Okay, and by the way, you might notice it's a little crowded in here. I tell people this regularly. Uh, some people get better. Uh, they save the best for last. I don't. The best, of, the best message was actually at 8.30. So if you guys want to switch services, uh, there's more space in that service, uh, and it's actually better. I'm just going to tell you. It's just better. It's the best I got. But you'll be better than the 11.15 service. How about that? All right. So we've been taking a look at several of these issues, and, and, and really, we just thought, you know, at the end of the day, the church should be answering questions that Christians have. Every single letter written by the Apostle Paul was written in response to all kinds of problems and questions that the church had. Too many times today, though, we've, we've made Christians synonymous with, like, really, really nice person, you know? Mr. Rogers in a sweater, you know? We're just going to kind of sit back, and we're not going to do anything that's going to make people upset or frustrated or any of that, but the Bible says that you and I as believers are supposed to be light in the darkness. Well, guess what the darkness doesn't like? Light, but it's the only thing that's going to heal our world. And so that's really what we've been doing over the last several weeks. I want to encourage you, if you're just new or, or jumping in for the first time, make sure that you go back and listen to some of the other messages. Uh, we've really, we're really building a foundation. I'm going to talk about it for just a minute. We started off week one uh, talking about the war against God. Make no mistake, the situation going on in our world is not a war against you and yours. It's actually a war against God. Satan hates God. He can't do anything on God, so he's going to go after the image bearer and the sons and daughters of God. That's you and me. Understanding that's so important to engaging uh, the culture wars. The next is this. How does Satan wage war on God? He distorts the truth. He doesn't change it. He just gets us to believe things that aren't it. And so we talked about a, really a hierarchy of truth. How do you process what's true and what's not according to Scripture? Did you know that there are absolute truths that are true whether or not you believe them or not? You break them, they will break you. Uh, we talked about the Ten Commandments, how the Ten Commandments, were, it wasn't, they weren't actually to, Jewish, uh, to our Jewish brothers and sisters, they weren't actually called commandments. In the original language, they were called statements or self-evident truths. Does that sound familiar? Okay, the Ten Commandments were just written down what works in human nature, how God created us to live and thrive in society. So we talked about the war on truth. Did you know that if the devil can get you to believe something that's not true, he can completely ruin your life? That's what we're seeing all around us. Then we built last week on the war against family. We war against family. We talked about how the family is the building block of all civilization. Every single problem starts in the human heart, then works its way out of the heart into our families. Many of us, we want to do all these big things and have all this cultural revolution and, and activism, but if we would just work on our families, we would be better. And so didn't you enjoy Dee last week? Didn't you do a great job? Come on, come on, give it up for her. Yep. She did a great job. I thought, man, who not better to talk about family? I think a, a female perspective is so important. We're talking about God's plan for family. We talked about how a lot of times God's ideals don't measure up to our reality, but that's okay. That's why we have the mercy and grace of God. You don't change the ideal, right? But, but when you accept it and then you accept where you are in relation to it, God can draw you towards the ideal. It wasn't about shame. It was about encouragement and, and moving forward as believers. And so if you missed last week, do that. Today, we're going to talk on top of that. What is the family's job? Today, we're going to talk about the war on education. Yeah, I'm going to go there. The war on education. Jesus says in Matthew 10, 6, 10, 
He was praying, and he was saying, praying to his father. He says, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I'm going to leave this verse up for just a minute. I will be going a little late today. I won't mention it again, but we are going to dig deeper into God's word in this area today. You know, if you would have asked me just four years ago, uh, as a pastor, I had lots of people ask me, Pastor, will you ever start a Christian school? I honestly would have said no. First of all, I don't know if anybody's ever actually started a school, but it is a lot of work, all right? And I would, here's what I would have said. I would have said, you know, I don't really need to do that because we still live in the free state of Texas. Come on, somebody, <laughs> right? We're like, well, you know, you know I, I, just, I, just, I was really, really naive, okay? And then 2020 happened, and our kids got to stay home with us. How many of y'all love that for a whole year? <laughs> yeah. Then we started discovering things. All of a sudden, these schools that our tax dollars fund, right, that are supposed to serve us and our family, that's how it was set up, all of a sudden, these teachers didn't want to go back. All of a sudden, they got comfortable staying at home. And maybe you're in here and you're an educator today. Just chill out. I'm going to be equal opportunity today. Okay, but all of a sudden we started seeing all of these things rise up and we started realizing some of the things that were being taught and, and some of the positions of the different school board members. And you would have thought in Texas that wouldn't be the case, right? Well, it is the case. Over a year ago, before last, last school year, uh, my kids were in a Belton school district, were in the Belton school district in a brand new school. My, my daughter started coming home asking questions that she would only get from her peers or someone else. I found out that she was reading books on her own with no supervision from the library. And some of these books had topics in them that, well, quite frankly, I would like to be the one to shape her mind on that. And so as a concerned parent, I went in. I was hastily referred to the librarian, told that they could fix all of my problems. So I went, and I was actually pretty kind at first. <laughs> and I asked the librarian, this is in Texas, you guys, Texas. I asked the librarian, hey, is this true? Well, yeah. She gets really, really smug, begins to instruct me how I don't get to control what's in her library. And I said, well, ma'am, that's unacceptable because I know I just got my property tax bill and I pay your salary and your boss's. I'd like to talk to your boss. Get the principal in here. So then I sat down to the principal. They're not bad people. This is, this is the system, though. This is what happens when parents step out of the process. They're not bad people. They're good people. And I proceeded to have the principal essentially tell me the same thing. And then if I wanted to change it, there was an email in a form and a process that I would have to go through to make sure that I could remove something that should never even be taught to my own kid. Think about this. This is in Texas. I proceeded to remove my kids from that school. Luckily, I married a smoking hot wife that is a doctor. So we were able to afford that. We had to give up some things. We had to move some things around. But I started to dig deeper into this problem. And I realized that it's a problem that started 60 years ago. It started 60 years, years ago in the sexual revolution and all of those young anarchists that grew up to most of them not have kids because they're gonna destroy the earth or some garbage like that. They went into academia and they're in every single one of our higher institutions. And I started realizing that it wasn't just a problem on the East Coast or the West Coast or in one of those liberal or leftist cities. I realized it's right here. And you might be thinking, okay, pastor, is this a time you rail against teachers? And you're, No, my whole family is a bunch of educators in the public school systems. This is where I want to take some time to talk to you as Christian parents about this war on education. Jesus here says, your kingdom come, Lord. Your will be done on earth as in heaven, not just in your house, but what you, the light you shine is not meant just for you. It's meant to bring heaven to earth. And, and we've really, I talked about this in the war on truth. There's always a cycle to what's going on. This has all happened before. We just need to firmly place where it started with us. One generation loves God. They're fired up, right? They serve God faithfully. Then they have kids. They get a little tired. They get a little lazy. They take their kids to church once a month, kind of end their life a little bit. What was a live, vibrant faith is now just tradition, those kids are kind of like, well, you know, my faith is like an accessory. Then they have kids and they don't teach anything. Then they have kids and they say, you know what? I'm going to dedicate every Sunday I have to their gymnastics program or to that select soccer team. And so we have a generation that knows God, a generation that knows of God, which results where we are today, a generation that knows not God. 
Now, that's the bad news. The good news is that's when revival happens. When you see this cycle happen, here's the, here's the thing. Because God's ways always work. And even people who don't know God, if they just think with the brain God gave them, they find God, and they start looking at these ideas and going, man, I don't know, just because you feel like you're this, I don't think you really are that. Man, I, 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 that, that idea doesn't make sense. That idea doesn't compute, and what ends up happening is a revival sparks, and the cycle starts all over. And many of us, we pray, God, if only we had a Moses. God, if only we had David, or what about Daniel, or what about those three you know, Hebrew boys with all that courage in that furnace? If only we had them, they could straighten this out. And yet every single one of them have ran their race, they finished, they heard, well done, my good and faithful servant. The Bible says in Hebrews, they're up in heaven, cheering us on, knowing that they weren't made for our time, they were made for our time. Cheering us on in our time to step up and to trust God just like they did. That's really what I feel like uh, this time is for the church. That's why we started teaching this series. Think about education for just a minute as I read Proverbs chapter 23, verse 7. For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. As he thinks in his heart, so is he. As he is shaped and educated, he becomes what he is. Education is not meant to be outsourced. It's central to how you and I develop into all that God's created us to be. Don't miss this. Our belief system is shaped. It doesn't happen accidentally. Our belief system is shaped by what? By observations, by associations, and yes, by teaching. What we do is what we believe. We can say whatever we want, but what we actually do, like, oh, pastor, I'm really passionate about the church, but you're only here once a month. Man, I'm really passionate about prayer. I know it changes things, but I won't get out of my seat during worship and come and let somebody pray for me. Oh, no, I just, I got my latte. I just feel comfortable. It's not what you say you believe. It's what you do. That's what you really believe. This is why education is so important. Nelson Mandela said, education is the most powerful weapon which we can use to change the world. He wasn't even a believer. Even the enemy knows that's the case. And I want to make a case for just a minute on how this happened, going back to the 60s. I'm going to go a little history, right? Not that revision is garbage, but like what really happened and how we got where we are. And then I'm going to give you some really practical ways that we can move in the opposite direction, quite frankly. Our education system in America has been hijacked from its original objectives, our early education instruction was given in the context of a worldview that put God in the center of life as the one to whom we orbit around. Reading, writing, and arithmetic were always secondarily compared to instruction in the ways of God. In order to prepare for life in this world, students needed to know how to relate to God and then orbit their life around him. The first American public school was established in 1635 by a Puritan minister named John Cotton. Virtually all public schools had ministers at headmasters. The number one book used was the New England Primer. It incorporated biblical values into all aspects of curriculum. Government paid for this book. Okay, to, talk, to go back, we have to go back to the very beginning. And it goes to this idea of separation of church and state. In the 60s, right, those radicals completely changed what our founding fathers meant by that phrase. You see, separation of church and state was not to protect you against the crazy church. It was actually to protect you against the crazy government. That's what it always was. Think about the people who came over and they didn't come over on cruise ships, y'all. It wasn't a carnival cruise. The Mayflower, that was hard. Many people died. What would make somebody want to leave? Was it just because they were really excited for a vacation? They would put their kids on there with no promise that they would make it over. It's because a heavy-handed government absorbed the church, there was no separation, and then oppressed the people. That's what happened. Because you see, you and I, like we are faith people. We can have our faith in God or our faith in ourself. It goes back to the true trees in the garden. We're gonna talk about that in just a minute. I was thinking, I read, 
don't know if you've looked much at the NEA, the National Education Association. It's still alive and well today, but it was founded in the 1800s as schools started taking off. And in 1897, this is what its charter was. If the study of the Bible is to be excluded from all state school, if the inculcation of the principles of Christianity is to have no place in the daily program, if the worship of God is to form no part of the general exercises of these public elementary schools, then the good of the state would be better served by restoring all schools to church control. That's what it said. Now imagine what they're saying today. It's unbelievable, but explainable. Governor Morris, one of the main writers of the U.S. Constitution, said religion is the only solid basis of good morals. Therefore, education should teach the precepts of religion and the duties of man toward God. You see, we, we used to not just talk about our rights. We used to actually talk about our responsibilities. That's what the Bible teaches you. There's what is, and then there's what you should do. You and I, the thing that makes us different than every other creation is we're made in the image of God. We can actually, like, we're moral creatures. We can make a choice. A lion that's really hungry, he's going to eat whatever in front of him. But we get to ask questions like, should we do that? And am I hungry? Maybe because, you know, I did something bad back here. And can I maybe negotiate with my future self so that in the future I won't be hungry? Maybe I could share. Maybe I could cooperate. You see, that's uniquely human. We're not the same as animals. Benjamin Rush, signer of the Declaration of Independence, in contemplating the political institutions of the U.S., I lament that we waste so much time and money in punishing crimes and take so little pains to prevent them. We profess to be Republicans, and yet we neglect the only means of establishing and perpetuating our reform, Republican form of government. That is the universal education of our youth in the principles of Christianity by means of the Bible. Abolition. That movement was spearheaded by pastors who decided, you know what, I may... It may look political, but we're going to end this evil institution in our nation. We're going to do it anyways. It was spearheaded by pastors. The great universities were also founded on the Bible as foundational. Harvard, the oldest learning institution in America, was founded in 1636. Its principal donor was a clergyman named John Harvard. Its purpose was for training and releasing into society clergymen and scholars with Puritan values. Harvard's Rules and Precepts, 1636, says, Let every student be plainly instructed and earnestly pressed to consider well. The main end of his life and studies is to know God and Jesus Christ, which is eternal life. Then it quoted John 17, 3, And therefore lay Christ at the bottom as the only foundation of all sound knowledge and learning. Yale, founded in 1701 by 10 congregational ministers, the leader of the Great Awakening, John Edwards, attended there. Princeton, founded in 1746 by Presbyterians to train Presbyterian ministers. Their motto was, under God's power, she flourishes. Cursed is all learning that is contrary to the cross of Christ. Princeton, how far we've fallen again, it didn't start today. This is important that you guys understand that. Because sometimes when we're standing in our time of history because we have an iPhone, we think we're like more enlightened. But Solomon, the wisest man who's ever lived, says there is, no, there is nothing new under the sun. Did you know that you and I, we can see the patterns and because we have moral capacity, we can change direction. That's what makes us human. Amen. This has happened before. From the beginning of time, we've had a choice from God. Do we eat from the tree of life or the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Eating from the tree of life is living a life dependent on God and aligning ourselves to his view of life, where he is the center. Eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is living independent of God, depending on yourself, your knowledge, your reason alone, it makes you the center. And today, you either have a biblical worldview or the other one. There is only two choices. There's only two trees. And you might ask, like, I, I've watched this as a pastor. I, I think pastors certainly have a lot of the blame in this. This is our job. Like, this is literally our job. I didn't get into ministry for you. I love you, but I got into ministry because God called me. Right? If I got into ministry for you, you just be mean to me and I'll just leave. Jesus knew this well with people. He said, I'm not gonna give myself to them because I, I know what's in them. Now, in his case, that wasn't in him, but in my case, that same thing's in me too. You know, they were waving palm branches when he was coming in and they were yelling crucify not too many days after. People are fickle, right? This is why we've gotta be rooted and grounded in scripture. And too many times, pastors wanna be liked and they wanna be influencers, whatever that means. To what end? When you look at the parable of the talents, right? The master gave three, two, and one. 
One guy, he was, he was so scared that he buried his talent. And the master came back and rebuked him. The Bible, Jesus actually says that man went to hell. That's what he said. And you, we look at that and we go, wow, that's a little overreaction, God. As if we put him on the throne. What's the moral? God does not give us what we have to sit on our hands and not make a difference. Matter of fact, he would rather you step out in faith and make some big mistakes and risk being called mean names than bury your talent. And so many people do that. I'm just, I'm just gonna tell you, the church in the United States is different than the church in China. It's exploding right now. The church in the Middle East is exploding. Unbelievable what God's doing. Unbelievable what he's doing in some of the darkest places on earth. But you know what's different from them and us? They have nothing to lose. And so it's easy for them to understand God has it all, but for us, we're comfortable. This all right, y'all all right? Yeah, don't look at me in that tone of voice. <laughs> Smile, it's okay, but be honest. Let's be honest. The crap we complain about is just like the early Christians just would have been like, oh Lord. I mean, they're being crucified, set on fire, like eaten by lions in the Colosseum. And we're worried that we're gonna lose our job because we stand up for our faith as if there's not another job. Here's what happens. Here's what happens as believers. Over time, the gifts that God gives us, I'm, I'm all for having gifts. I like nice things. I believe God blesses you. I believe he blesses you to be a channel. I believe even the channel gets wet. Come on, somebody. I'm not a poverty guy. I don't believe that's what God's called us to do. You gotta have something to give something. I'm just saying, right? From the widow's mite to the bajillionaire, you gotta have something to give something. It's not about that. But, but what happens is we move from, God, thank you, I'm a steward, to now I just, wanna, I just wanna hold everything that I have. What did Jesus say about the person who held onto their life? It's a supernatural principle. What happens to that person's life? They lose it anyways. Cancel culture comes after you. You go, oh, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. Here's an official apology. They kill you anyways. That's funny, isn't it? They're telling us to be tolerant. They literally murder their own over and over and over again. It's one of the most merciless things you've ever seen. There's no apology big enough to their self-righteousness. It's self-righteousness because it doesn't come from the Bible. What led to this? It's like a frog in water, you know? I don't know why you put a frog in water, but if you wanted to boil a frog, don't try to throw the frog in boiling water. You put him in nice warm water, you know, like a hot tub. And then you turn it up one degree at a time. How do we get here? One degree at a time. How do we get back? One degree at a time. That's the power of the church. What are some of the philosophies that led us, even Christians, to believe and to fall for some of these things? Some of you right now, as I'm talking about this, you're like, man, you're just being so political. You're just mean. My pastor said, if you have to say anything mean, just say it and then smile. <laughs> some of you are, and I'm gonna tell you why. It's because you have more of the world in you than you have the Bible in you. And some of you, like, listen, I'm gonna tell you as a pastor, most pastors aren't comfortable with their people with this. They're not comfortable with what happens with, when, when the Holy Spirit convicts their people. So you preach God's word, and there's something in you. You're, go, you're listening, you're like, I don't know, about what's, where is he gonna go? I don't know. And I say something that's scriptural, that's clear, that's historical, that actually is science, you know? And inside you go, oh, that's not what I wanna know. That's not what my mom taught me. That's not what I learned from my leftist professor. That doesn't sound like the lamb petting Jesus. You do that, right? And something does this, and here's what you do. This is the temptation. Self-righteousness comes in right here. What that is, that's actually called the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And what you should do is change your way because God's never gonna change his. That's important. So how do we get here? There's some philosophies that led to this, and you need to understand them because they're pervasive in our thinking, they're pervasive in our culture, and they always hold us down. The first one is this, humanism. Humanism is an ethical philosophy that prioritizes universal human qualities and intellects. Here's what humanism says. Humanism says people are inherently good. If you believe that, you don't believe the Bible about people. Some of y'all, you're so offended because you give people way too much credit. <laughs> the Bible says we're inherently flawed and sinful. The Bible says we don't move from, from disorder to order naturally. We move from order to disorder, from order to chaos. The Bible says we need Jesus. It's completely different than what humanism says. Yes, average person, how do you know that you're going to heaven? Oh, I'm a good person. That is completely irrelevant. And it's completely dishonest, quite frankly. You live with yourself. You live in your own head. You know some of the thoughts you had. If you knew some of the thoughts I had just this morning, you'd be like, I don't want to listen to him. <laughs> Come on. What, what does the Bible say? The Bible doesn't say people are inherently good. The Bible says everything above hell is by God's grace. 
and we need God's grace in our life. Yes. Built on top of that is this idea of atheism, the belief that there is no God. By the way, I don't believe in atheism. I think it's a myth. Everyone believes in, believes in God. God is either God or God is himself, but they all believe in God. I've never met an atheist that really lived that out to its end, and they weren't some of the most hateful, resentful people you ever be around. You really want that life, go down that path, young person. You really think you know more than your parents. You just go down that path, that school of resentment, and see where it leads. Built on top of that is rationalism. Reason is the supreme authority in matters of opinion, belief, or conduct. Now, this is a half-truth. Did you know God gave you a brain for a reason? You should use it. When you teach your kids how to think biblically about things, they'll find God. They will. It's half of the coin, right? It's, it, it, it's, it's thinking that we can actually get the most out of our head by removing God from the foundation. Then you have liberalism. And I'm not talking about classical liberalism here. I'm talking about leftism is really what I'm talking about. It's a cover for all of these things, right? A cover for all of these philosophies that you can believe in God without actually living any of his standards. You can tweet it, therefore it's true. Wow. You act out what you believe though. I don't care what you say. I've learned this the older I've gotten, and some of you older people, you have gray hair and bald heads because you learned this maybe a little too late. I'm hoping to learn a little quicker anyways. <laughs> but don't, don't believe what someone says. Watch what someone does. This is our problem. This is our problem. Now, so how, what do we do? By the way, the motto for the satanic Bible is do as thou wilt. Man, doesn't that sound like our culture? It's the motto. So who's training the next generation? Let's go to that question right now. Like, who is it? Because here's the problem. We've outsourced it. It's like public education, whatever that means. You really want them educated that way? So who's doing it? Well, 72% of all educators are leftists. By their own admission, this is a survey, 28% would be considered conservative. In elite Ivy League schools, 87% are left. 15% are conservatives. How'd this happen? Because the devil's really smart, and he knows how it works. Right? The frog. It's the frog. Right? That, that, that's what happens, just a little by little, little by little, little by little, little by little. So what do we do to turn back that tide? There are lots of things we can do. You're either a victim of the world or you're a son or daughter of God. You cannot be both at the same time. And if we're gonna be sons and daughters of God, we've gotta actually step up and stand up for what's right. I would call this humble resolve. You know, you can be nice and tell the truth. You can be kind. You can set a standard and not move. Right? There's, there's nothing more biblically Christian than that. That's what billions of Christians have done that have gone before us. Now we have an opportunity to do it in our generation. How do we do it? How do we win? First, parents must take responsibility for their children's education. You must take responsibility. Yeah, you can clap for that. You must take responsibility. Meaning that nobody is more important, only second to God, to your children's future than you. Stop apologizing. Take responsibility for it. Don't ever apologize stepping in and advocating for one of your kids. Don't ever apologize standing up in a school board meeting. Don't ever apologize. Even when they call you mean, at the end of the day, you are going to stand before God one day and give an account. By the way, those kids are God's, not yours. Proverbs 4.20 my son, pay attention to my words. Listen closely to my sayings. Don't lose sight of them. Keep them within your heart, for they are life to those who find them and health to one's whole body. Guard your heart above all. Even say all. In the Hebrew, all means all. It's the same word in English. It's the most important thing. More than sports, more, more, more than money. It's the most important thing. Guard your heart. Guard your heart above all, for it is the source of life. Bible says, for everything you do flows from it. Deuteronomy 6, 4. Listen, Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all. Let me say all. all. Same Hebrew word. With all your heart. With all. Let me say all. all. With all your soul. And with all. Let me say all. all. With all your strength. The words I'm giving you today are to be in your heart. They're not just supposed to be heard on Sunday. They're supposed to be in front of you every day. Why? Because it's so easy to get distracted, to get confused. You have to keep them in front of you because the world is gonna fight like hell to remove them. To be upon your heart, to be in one's constant, conscious reflection. Every adult must be a teacher, period. Every parent, you are a teacher. 
Just accept it. You may not have the degree. Okay, you have the degree from Hard Knocks. Come on. <laughs> you are a teacher, period. End of story. You're a teacher. Your child is learning, living in your community. Next, parents must impress God's character and ways on their children. I love this, impress. Your kids will not find God on their own. You've got to impress it. You've got to cooperate with the Holy Spirit. Don't apologize for directing your children. The world's directing them. And how's that going? Deuteronomy 6, 7, repeat them to your children. Talk about them when you sit in your house and when you walk around the road. When you lie down and when you get up, you see the theme. Bind them as a sign on your hand and let them be a symbol on your forehead with them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. If you missed last week, go back. D talked about the four impressionable times of the day. When you wake up, right? When you go, when you go in your car time, talked about dinner time and bedtime. It's not that complicated. You do have time because you were together those four times. It's so important. Take advantage of those impressionable times. Three, parents must live out an authentic faith. This is huge. Faith isn't something you do for your children. It won't work if you do it that way. It's something you show your children. Did you know an authentic faith is caught? It's not just taught. If, you don't, if they don't catch it from you, if you're just doing it for them, I see pastors do this. I see, I see grown people do this all the time. They're like, yeah, we just, wanna, we, just wanna, we just want the youth group to be really good for our kids. I can't stand the church and I'm not growing. But man, as long as our kids are that growing. Wait, wait a minute. Whoa, whoa, no, no, no. It flows down from you. Your strength. I love this passage. I love this passage. Proverbs 24, 16. Though a righteous person falls seven times, he will get back up, but the wicked will stumble into ruin. Your kids need to see you fall on your face and then they need to see what you do about it. What do you do? You get back up. You show them what's up. My daughter came in crying because she was scared of this rooster in our backyard. And I'm going to tell you, every bit of me as a parent wanted to take a shotgun and just go kill that annoying thing. His name's Dash. And I just had to go, wait a minute. Man, if I teach her that I'm going to fix all these problems, I told her, I said, I'll let you kill it. She's like, I would never do that, Papa. I go, okay, good. Then you're going to have to learn to deal with it. You know how you deal with a chicken? You face it. It comes at you, man, you stare that sucker down. You know why, honey, that chicken doesn't mess with me? Because it knows it'll be the last thing it does. <laughs> Part of raising kids isn't protecting them from everything. It isn't. It's making them so strong that no matter what comes at them, they're gonna defeat it. It's making them stronger, and that's hard for parents because by definition, if you do your job, you fail and they leave. You know, you want to protect him. You want to keep him forever, but, but they need to go, right? They need to go. That's when they're most happy as well. I've never met a man that's happy living in his parents' basement for his entire life. I haven't. Finally, actually, we have a couple more. Thanks for the music. Parents must take responsibility for what their kids consume. Uh, I'm going to talk about this. Um, it is your job to take responsibility for what goes in because whatever goes into them they'll become full of and they'll become um, I, I, we have a screen problem and listen my kids throw fits too and it is just easier to give them a screen I'm not anti-technology but the companies that are behind those devices don't give a crap about your kids nobody will love your kids more than God more than you and more than the church nobody why would you give up that influence don't do it we, we put them down. I know it's crazy, but buy some Lincoln Logs. Y'all remember what those are? They will figure it out. You did. I did. I mean, there's too many screens. Protect what they consume. I have every right by God to question anyone, a librarian, a principal, one of their friends' parents. I have every right to remove somebody from their life if I would like to. Not from this world, that's murder, but removing them from their life. <laughs> stop apologizing about that. It's like, we're, we're so, we're like, stop apologizing. You don't have to be crazy. You want to process with them. There's different milestones for different ages. You got to have conversations. Like my kids, they learn anatomical names for their body parts. I know, it's weird. People are like, wow, they, they, they're real scienced up, aren't they? Yeah. They're growing up. Take responsibility for what your kids consume. It is not the teacher's responsibility to raise your kids. It is not their responsibility. 
for everything. This is part of the problem. Teachers are overwhelmed, you know? And, and, and there are two different sides of the problem. Parents have to take responsibility first, and then we can deal with that. But as a result, what's happened is they're so overwhelmed that it's allowed this leftist garbage to weasel its way into every single school, even in Central Texas. And as a result, because parents haven't stepped up, well, the state's done it. I don't know about you, but everything government t- touches just doesn't get better. I mean, it does get better, right? Parents must take responsibility. Why? Proverbs twenty two fifteen. 15. Foolishness is bound to the heart of a youth. A rod of discipline will separate it from him. A lot of people do the spare the rod, spoil the child. That's what this verse is. The rod isn't just a switch, okay? The rod is a shepherd's staff. And sometimes, yeah, man, you gotta flip that sucker around, you know? But it's meant to guide and to direct. When you do your job right, you give your kids 10 and two. The Bible says you train up a child in the way that you go when they're older, they won't depart. Think about that for just a minute. When you're in trouble, when you don't know what to do, when you've encountered something for the first time and it's overwhelming, what do you fall back on? What you know. That's what that scripture's saying. You know what? They're gonna be mouthy. They're gonna think they know it all just like you did at their age, right? But then they're gonna get out there and they're gonna experience the truth of life. And when, not if, the storm hits them from the side, which it will, and some of y'all are praying for it. Come on, Jesus, okay? They're gonna remember what you impressed on them and they're gonna fall back on that. For example, when you get hurt, is the first thing you do is to isolate from all the family of God? Guess what they're gonna do? Same thing. You only lose alone in the body. It's wolves look for the people who are loners. They peel them off one by one and kill them, right? If every time you encounter struggle, do you fall into a puddle on the floor and cry like a baby? I'm not saying there's no room for that. But at some point, Paul says, when I was a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. But then he said, but then I grew up. And what do you got to do? Put away childish things. Nobody's going to care about those kids more than you. Grow up. That's what you got to do. I, trust me, I remind it all the time. I want to whine. Kyle looks at me. Remember what you said to them people? Grow up. You know, do you wallow in self-pity? What do you do? They're going to do what you do. They're not going to do what you say. They're going to do what you do. Finally, as we close, parents must keep their family planted in the local church. You can read um, Psalm 92, 12 on your own. Write that down. You should be really careful as a believer how you talk about your church and Christians in your life. They're listening. And you know what? Sometimes Christians and leaders do dumb things and they hurt you. There's no such thing as church hurt unless you bumped your head on the door on the way in. People hurt people, and that's true. This is why God gives us Matthew 18, to deal with those right away. But be very, we're very, me and my wife, we're very careful when we talk about other people in their lives that love God. You go and you gossip. You go from one church to another church to another church. You constantly pull up your family all the time. That's going to come back and hurt you. Because one day they're not gonna listen to you. And here's my question to you, who are they gonna listen to? One of the things I'm so grateful for, I didn't say this in the last service, but I'm so grateful for this. My wife's parents instilled in her such a reverence and respect for God's people, for the church, and especially leaders. And I know where they grew up. I grew up in the same church. Those leaders were not perfect. There were some bad things that happened, some things that weren't good that had to be dealt with. But, but, but they, they protected her in that way. And you know what's crazy is? As we've been married and we have problems and we have issues, You know, think about this. We all have problems. She's never once thought, I'm going to go run away. She's always thought, no, I revere God too much for that. No, I'm going to lean into somebody in my church and I'm going to find an answer. I'm going to ask for help. And then I'm going to respect it enough to listen. You see, there are two institutions ordained by God to raise kids. One, train a child up in the way they should go. That's a parent. In, that's a parent. Second, the local church. Ephesians 4.11. God himself, Christ himself gave gifts to equip the body for works of service. He lists the gifts and he says, unity and maturity, family language, is what the outcome of when we do our, th- our stuff right. We grow up and we remain unified. Does that make sense? I, I just believe this. I don't believe the answer's out there. There's some things we gotta do in the meantime, okay? But right now, we can all look at our own family, lean into our own life, and we can make adjustments where we need to. I believe that's the future of everything moving forward. Let me pray for you. God, I thank you so much for the power of your word. I thank you, Father, for what you're doing in our church. 
I pray right now, Father, for each and every one of us as we engage this war on education. You gotta speak to us. I pray you open up doors, relationships. God, it's gonna be different for every person in how we engage and how we take responsibility if we haven't. And I just pray, Father, for wisdom and guidance, courage, and steadfastness, Lord. I also pray, Father, for anybody in here that doesn't know you. I pray, God, that they wouldn't leave this room the way they came in. As heads are bowed, eyes are closed, we're almost done. I believe one of the most important things we do each and every week is we create a place and a space for people far from God to draw near to him. Maybe you're in here and you're far from God. I don't have to rub your face in it. You know if you're far from God. Maybe at one point you gave your life to Christ, but you know you're not following. Maybe you've never given your life to Christ, but as God's word's been taught, you're being, you're, being, you're being compelled to make a decision. That's not compulsion by me. That's the Holy Spirit inviting you to be more than you could ever be on your own. And as heads are bowed, eyes are closed, maybe you're in here and that's you. I wanna pray for you. I'm not gonna embarrass you. I'm not gonna call you to the front. We're not gonna do anything weird. But Jesus does say that if you acknowledge me before men, I'll acknowledge you before my Father. But if you don't, I won't. If that's you in here, you say, Pastor, pray for me. Would you just put your hand up halfway and put it right back down? Has anybody in here, you say, Pastor, pray for me. Thank you. You just put it up and put it right back down. I see you. Just up and down. I see you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Is so anyone else, you say, that's me. That's me. Pray for me. I'm far from God. I don't want to be. Anyone else? Thank you. Thank you. I see you. In a moment, we're going to pray a prayer. All of us are going to pray it with you so as to encourage your faith. But I want to encourage you to mean this prayer with all your heart. Speak it loud enough just where you can hear your own voice. As you pray, I believe God's gonna tell you to do something. Here's my advice to you. Do what he says. We're also gonna give you some instruction at the end, but it is the first step. It's an act of free will. It's confession with your own mouth that what the Bible says about Jesus is true, that he died on the cross and he rose from the dead. I believe on the other side of this prayer, you're gonna get a step and it's gonna start a journey. It's not a parking spot. It's a starting place. I believe God's gonna move. And as a church, you're surrounded by people who love God and we're gonna pray this prayer with you to encourage your faith. And we're also gonna stand with you as you grow. Church, we believe in what they're doing. Let's all pray this prayer together. Let's everyone pray, Jesus, thank you for coming to this earth, for living a perfect life. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. I believe that you are good and I believe you're God. I believe on the third day, after you were killed, that you rose from the dead. I believe you conquered death forever to give me life forever. Today I accept life. Today I make you my Lord, my Savior, and my King. Today I'm new. Lead me and guide me. Show me what's next. It's in your name that we pray. And everybody said, amen. Amen. Come on, church, let's put our hands together.